Well, welcome everybody to Love, Healing, and Pleasure for Social Justice Educators. This is recorded for Washington State Board of Community and Technical Colleges by Patricia McDonald, Stephanie Ojeda-Ponce, and Alicia Williams. 2023, licensed under CC-BYND 4.0. This is an abridged version of our National Conference on Race and Ethnicity 2023 workshop, Love, Healing, and Pleasure for Social Justice Educators. And accessibility has been in mind while recording this, and all slides will be read and photos described. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hope you got a chance to dance with us when you heard the music come on. We are excited that you are here with us. Um, I am Patricia McDonald. I am an educator of 29 years and a colleague of these um, wonderful ladies that I am with today um, to share, um, invite curiosity, to um, invite you to think about ways that you care for self. And I did that, started today with thinking about um, our time together and the space that I'm in and um, engaging in some deep breathing exercises to help calm my body. We are hoping that you will have something to write with today because um, we've got lots of things for you to reflect on. And I am excited to introduce my other friends. Hi, I'm Stephanie Ojeda Ponce. I have been an educator for 12 years and um, I'm excited to share uh, uh, just a snippet of the work that we did when we were at Encore in New Orleans. Uh, something I wanted to highlight about this presentation and some of the differences is one, this is gonna be a YouTube video and we want you to really engage as if, as close to as if you were live in the workshop with us as well. There's so much that we um, are not able to transfer into this type of format that were like rich components of our in-person format. Uh, I also wanted to offer that we might be in different mental spaces and capacities uh, and that there's a cycle sometimes of how we're feeling about our work, how we're coming to the work and how it seems to be treating us. Uh, I was super positive and such a vibe in at the Encore time period, I was, towards the end of a six months of sabbatical and took the summer off. So I did not set foot in the workplace for nine months. I didn't interact very significantly with the institution. And um, and now I'm deep back in it. And it was a rude awakening going back. So that's actually brought me back to the work in a different frame of mind. And I am learning new and different lessons or new perspectives on the lessons that I had really enjoyed learning before. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Williams, and I have been an educator for 12 years as well. I bring to you this space self-love. I am on this journey of self-love and experiencing all the things that we are bringing to you today right now. So as I go, this, go through this journey with you, um, I invite you to you know, listen to what we're saying, take your notes down, whatever applies to you, um, you know, give us a shout out when you can. Um, and also just really dig deep into yourself to find out where are the places that I need to spend more time self-loving myself. So welcome. We welcome you. I love that, friends. I think what we're um, elevating is that um, and what I like about this is that people can come back to it when you're in different places, when you need a reminder, when you need to um, check in with yourself, come back to this recording. We've got lots of tools and tips for you um, to love self. All right. So our content objectives, use Chapman's love language and appreciation language to identify ways we can engage in self-care. Identify ways you can increase pleasure in your work and create room for rest. And experiment with somatic healing practices that regulate the nervous system. I want to take a moment to call in our awareness. This is going to be 
may be different than some other types of workshops that you've attended, and uh, that's intentional. So I wanna share with you some art by an artist and educator that the three of us greatly respect and learn from, Eileen Jimenez of My Essay Art. And this is one of her art pieces. It's called Radical Joy, Radical Love. And it shows a brown hand reaching up towards the sun. The hand is sprouting leaves and a flower. And there is a colibri, a hummingbird, flying towards the flower for a tasty snack. The sun has many yellow spokes and is surrounded by black circles and the words radical joy radical life. Today, I want to call in our awareness through writing and reflection. We mentioned earlier that we're going to be doing a lot of writing and you're going to need some paper and pencil or pen. Uh, you might get markers, watercolors, whatever feels fun to write with for you. Uh, some people might like to do digital, but I really encourage you to use handheld tools and actual print paper to write your notes because that engages a different part of your cognition. And what we write, we invite. So there's lots of opportunities to reflect today. I love that. I That's like funny. that a lot. What we write is what we invite. We invite. <laughs> I wanna talk about our work feelings. Uh, and I was fairly new to feelings a few years ago. Uh, feelings weren't really a thing that we talked about or uh, were allowed to experience. And uh, when I, not that many years ago, I was in a place that uh, when I had intense feelings, I thought it was a stomach ache. And um, I could be smiling and laughing about it, but I'm laughing at my pain because that's actually very true. You know, uh, feelings felt like headaches and stomach aches, and I wouldn't necessarily be able to identify what was going on. Uh, through a lot of different practices, I started to learn some feeling words and pay attention to what was going on in my body and put a name to some of the things that I was experiencing. So towards that, I want you to please write two lists. On one side, you're going to write words that describe how you most often feel at work. On the other side, write some pleasurable feelings you do have or could have at work. So in the image and example, on the side, there's the work feels, and I have my column that I called the usual feels. Tired, annoyed, misunderstood, exploited, alone, isolated, um, and my ideal feels. Supported, understood, valued, dollar signs. We want to be valued as humans, but I also like to be fiscally valued for my labor with money. Patient, generous, community. So... These are just some examples. I'm going to give you a few more on the next slide. And we're going to leave this slide up. We want you to pause the video and to take that time to write a few example work feelings for yourself. And you can use the examples from my own experiences on the previous slide or use this slide to help you think about new words. These are not meant to be representatives. They're just words to help you get started with ideas like valued, supported, enthusiastic, overwhelmed, stress, creative, disrespected, optimistic, guilty, ashamed, isolated. Patricia, I remember when I first did this exercise, I thought about it for a minute and was like, how do I feel like, and oftentimes I felt unseen and so that was one of the words that I put down was, you know, that I want to be seen, you know, see me for who I am and what I offer to this space and environment. And so what are one of the things that came to your mind when you, when we first did this exercise? Oh, this always brings up so much, right? When we think about the things my usual feels, um, and it really depends on who, which community I'm working with, right? With students, I'm feeling um, fulfillment. Um, but when it's some of the systems that I work within, um, unappreciated. And um, how I'd like to feel is valued and respected and appreciated. Um, so I'm excited that you've got some plans for us to talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, save, uh, save that list. We're going to do some more writing and we're going to come back to talking about work feelings. Some, uh, I know for, for me, a lot of the points in time where I do this activity, my usual feels are mainly negative ones. And a lot of us may even start to think of really emotionally intense mo uh, moments at work or things that were harmful to us and had a deep negative impact. And there might even be many of those instances or we may kind of be constantly experiencing hostile work environments um, or inhospitable climates, we might say, to avoid the HR terms. Um, so what I want you to do is take a deep breath in and out, maybe a couple of them. And we're gonna set some of those negative feelings aside just for right now, not because they're not important or not real, but because there are other areas where we may discuss them and because I want you to also have some loving and positive experiences and to gain some tools, not just for being in the negative, but being in the positive. And while we know some people don't always have opportunities to talk through all of those difficult experiences, we want to really center the love, healing, pleasure, joy and cultivating of community for this session. On the next slide, Alicia is going to tell you how to do that leading with love. All right, let's get into it. So before we can even understand what our love languages are, we have to, in the workplace, we have to understand where we're at. We have to understand how we're loving ourselves and so the first thing I think we should do is check in with ourselves. Where are we? How are we feeling? What are we doing with ourselves? So I ask you to take out your cell phones, turn on your camera, and turn it to selfie mode. Now, we're not going to take a picture or anything like that, but we are going to look into our phones. We're going to do this together. So right now, is everyone seeing themselves? Can you see yourself? Okay. So I ask the question, what do you see? Take a deep look in your phones. What do you see? I when I did this, when I did this workshop at Encore, I asked the same question and what happened was the first thing in mind was did you see positive things about yourself first or did you see negative things about yourself Patricia I have to I have to admit friend that the first time that we ever did this together was such a an eye-opener right because I got slapped in the face with how much negativity I was thinking about myself and I still struggle with that every time we do this, but it's, it's helped me have more awareness. You know, it really is given me an opportunity to, to notice that internal self-talk and whether it's positive or negative. So I'm, I'm shifting the script. Thank you for offering that up. Stephanie, what'd you see? Um, I, I saw myself pretty literally, actually, but I've done this type of activity a lot. I have been in therapy um, and I'm a, I've graduated from therapy and just go on an as needed basis these days. But um, I had really uh, like serious experiences when first having to do this uh, or similar activities where I would be looking at myself in the selfie camera mode. And um, so for me, a lot of the experience and noticing was like, yeah, I noticed some literal things about myself, um, just like random observations of what I'm seeing. But I also feel a lot more neutral than I used to. So I think that's a, just an example of how my own self-image and stuff has shifted. And I don't necessarily even mind if it's not a whole bunch of positive things because uh, acceptance is something that I am working towards these days. So it makes me wonder if maybe I'm already, maybe I'm already partway there with the acceptance journey. That's good. Thank you for offering that up. Next slide, please. 
All right. So when I see myself, I see a masterpiece worthy of self-love. When we can see ourselves as we truly are and accept, Stephanie, you just talked about that, accept ourselves, we build the necessary foundation for self-love. And that's a quote that I found by Bell Hooks. So you are worthy of self-love. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the five love languages. Gary Chapman and Paul White, they came up with this concept that if we want to love ourselves and, and love one another, we have to figure out what makes us tick. So they came up with these five concepts. The first one is words of affirmation. The second one is quality time, physical touch, giving of gifts, and acts of service. And if you want to dive deep into what makes you tick and what your love language is, then we also have a quiz that you can take here provided on this slide. You could take a picture uh, with your cell phones and it'll take you directly to the quiz and you'll be able to figure out what your love language actually is. What's okay. your strongest? I'm interested in yours. What's your what's your strongest love language? So mine used to be words of affirmation uh, for a long time. And now as I get a little older in age, I'm finding that acts of service means a lot more to me than what people tell me. I gotta see what you do um and 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 show, you know, partner with me and working with me. So acts of service for me is a little bit more um meaningful now. Yeah. What for, about you? I took the quiz um just yesterday and I think again it's this um theme that we've got going through here that we evolve. We're always evolving and we change and gr we're growing. Um I'm noticing quality time more than anything is just quality time with the people that I love is really important. Um, and so I'm Definitely. glad I got to take that. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to share mine because <laughs> for me, it was a, it, it was like a really elucidating experience to get the quiz because it wasn't just learning that acts of service was so high up on the list um, by far. And then quality time right after but I feel like that goes hand in hand because if you're doing an act of service for someone it usually involves time um but I do love acts of service and what was most surprising is words of affirmation I only scored three percent out of the hundred percent on words of affirmation so that really showed me that um you know in my responses even if it's not a hundred percent you know like super correct uh, results based on those questions, it's still going to indicate to me that I don't value words of affirmation very much. And that's actually one of the main and almost only ways and in an infrequent way that we're evaluated in the workplace. For example, as a faculty member, I might write like a 40 page reflection on something and get back like a paragraph or two um, with some affirming words. But that is every few years. And if words of affirmation are worth almost nothing in my book, then I'm essentially not ever getting any kind of feeling of being valued or, you know, respected or loved. You know, for some people who are not like new to using the concept of love in the workplace, you might think of it as respect or appreciation. So words are not doing it for me. Kind of like Alicia said, I want to see your actions. Um, and that was really a learning experience. Thank you for sharing. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did I come up with this idea to even find Gary Chapman and Paul White? There was a lot of conflict in our office and I could not, and this is at a, at a workplace, but I could not figure out like, how can we dismantle all this toxicity how can how can we just you know you know love on one another and so what I found in this practice was that we all love and learn and accept appreciation in different ways and what I learned was that if I'm not appreciating you in a way that makes you tick then you're not going to feel valued at all and that was similar to what Stephanie is saying like words of affirmation do absolutely nothing for her 
And so what I found was that if we would learn each other's love language or appreciation language in the workplace, then we can feel more appreciated. That way, the productivity in the office would be better. It'd be less conflict. People will feel more appreciated. And so that's how um, I came up with this idea. I started doing research and there was a book and I found it and boom, it worked. So let's start off with what these actually are and what they mean in the workplace. So words of affirmation, those are, you know how your boss comes to you and say, Alicia, good job. We really appreciate the hard work that you did today. Um, thank you so much for your time. That is uh, words of affirmation. Quality time is when you can spend time with your, your bosses and your supervisors and your colleagues and just sit there with them and, you know, just engage and not work stuff, but more like a cup of coffee. Let's just talk about other things outside of work. So just spending quality time to have conversation outside of what's going on in the office, but just quality time to just, you know, be yourselves and spend time with one another. Acts of service looks like your supervisor or your colleague coming to you and saying, hey, can I help you write that paper? Or can I help you grade your, uh, your student's homework assignments? Can I help you with anything? That is acts of service that we all can appreciate, right? Especially since it's pretty much the end of the quarter and we all need a little bit of help. <laughs> Tangible gifts. That's like, I appreciate you by, let me get you a, a Starbucks gift card, or can I offer you a plant? Um, I want to bring a plant to you or, you know, just some type of gift that shows that you really, really appreciate your colleagues and your, or your supervisor appreciating you, you know, that's what tangible gifts are. Physical touch. Now this one could be you know, a little tricky because it's not a sexual thing, but, you know, you got to be mindful of how you're touching your colleagues and supervisor or your staff members. And so I usually do a fist pound, like, hey, good job. Thank you for all that you're doing in our office. And those things, you know, you might ask if you want to give a hug, you might ask first, can I hug you? And then they say, OK, and then it's OK to hug. But for the most part, me, I try to keep it a little fist pound. <laughs> <laughs> so those are what they mean um, in the workplace. Next slide, please. All right. Self-love languages are pretty much the same thing. I won't take too much of your time, but when we have words of affirmation, it's, it's like positive self-talk. So imagine looking at yourself in the mirror in the bathroom before you get in the shower or after and you say, hey, Alicia, you're looking beautiful today. I just love the way your eyebrows are shaped today. <laughs> or, hey, Alicia, you're doing a wonderful job. Keep going, keep going. Oftentimes, um, for me, my positive self-talk is, is keep going. You know, no matter what, um, you're going to get up and you're going to keep going because you're going to be okay. So self-improvements are also words of affirmation. Um mindfulness, being mindful of how we talk to ourselves. Sometimes we got that negative chatter box in our minds. Oh, you didn't do this right. Or, oh, you're going to uh, be late today. Or, oh, just the negative starts to take control. So we want to be mindful of what we're telling ourselves. And then journaling, writing things out, you know, writing things down is another source that you can put in your toolbox for words of affirmation. Acts of service, okay, nothing wrong with going to therapy. There's nothing wrong with going to therapy. I know in my community, oftentimes we are taught, like, I don't want to talk to a stranger. I'm not talking to a stranger today. So I think therapy is good. That's just my opinion, you know. Planning, planning things out. That can also help you a lot with, you know, just your day-to-day -day work. Organizing, organizing my closet a couple of weeks ago was like the best thing I could have did for myself. It just cleared my mind. Uh, so organizing your closet, your workspace, whatever you need to do to help you clear your mind and stay on this self-love, you can do that. And self-care, just taking some time out for you. You might need to say, oh, I need a personal day off. Take it. 
some of us are workaholics and be like, I need to get this done. I'm going to stay here till 12 o'clock at night. No, take your self-care day. Your personal day is yours to love on yourself. Physical touch. These are like body movements. As you've seen earlier today, we was rocking and swaying, rock, sway, hugging and loving on each other. Um, I have on this soft, 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 sweater blanket type of soft sweater um so on here you'll see you know soft blankets the way that makes you feel uh those are good for physical touch massages who doesn't like a good deep tissue i mean i do <laughs> so good massages is some ideas for physical touch also taking a nice bath some of us might need to put some epsom salt in there some of us may not depending <laughs> but a nice bath also receiving gifts okay how can i gift myself today i can gift myself by maybe buying that coach purse on sale or not <laughs> <laughs> maybe taking myself on a vacation, you know, some alone time with self, that's good. Or investing, whatever you need to do to invest in yourself, maybe getting your, uh, take yourself to a football game or, uh, you know, maybe even just going to a spa with your friends, whatever it makes you feel good that you can gift yourself is where we're getting at with that. Quality time. Quality time looks like movie nights or, you know, meditation. Before we started today, we all had our ways of how we meditated, whether it be a prayer, whether it be a deep breath. So for me, it's prayer. I pray. Um, reading. Stephanie loves, loves, loves to read. So reading is one that you can spend time with yourself, quality time and hobbies. Patricia, she likes to go everywhere. <laughs> So, you know, what What do you like to do? What makes you tick? And then spending quality time with yourself that, with the things that make you tick um, is what self-love is a part of our languages. So next slide, please. Before we, before we go to the next slide, we want to remind participants that um, if you want to get out your camera and scan this QR code, it's going to take you to a Padlet where we have um, the love, the appreciation languages and love language, love languages up. And we're going to be collecting ideas from the people that read this um, or watch this session. And um, I hope that it's a resource that we can come back to and continue to see it get larger and larger with lots of ideas about the ways that we can um, receive and give appreciation in the workplace. I know um, from our last session at Encore, um, there were so many amazing ideas about the ways that we can show appreci appreciation at the workplace. And I think it was um, so, uh, so much innovation and in thinking outside the box, right? Because we're, we're oftentimes so socialized that work isn't a place that we can bring love into. And I just, so I, I'm excited to see how people populate this Padlet. Please go there and share with us the amazing ways that you take care of yourself and you can um, also take care of your colleagues and peers at work. I offer, I want to offer one example. I actually just uh, thought of today that um, I think of an active service that I do, and especially a lot of uh, Black and, and Indigenous and women of color of all ethnicities and cultures uh, may do and are often asked to do at disproportionate rates to others. Uh, but we're doing acts of service. Uh, really often in like when we're taking minutes, when we're creating the outlook request, when we're sending the email, when we're doing all of these um, little details to make things keep running, those are acts of service that we're performing. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, for all three of us, we're often doing a lot of work in our personal and professional lives. So for me, who's an active service love person, when Patricia is like, I know how to make a cool presentation out uh, itinerary for us to use as notes and I'm going to make it for us. That feels like love to me. It's an act of service. Um, but I also want you to think a little bit about how you are actually, you know, maybe unintentionally and subconsciously you're showing love and performing acts of service and giving quality time and doing all these things and speaking your love and values to those around you in the workplace really frequently. But sometimes it doesn't necessarily feel like you're doing that act 
in a conscientious way, but it's just part of your work task. So we'll talk about that a lot in the next section. And the next section is pleasure activism, which I'm super excited to talk with you about. Um, I was familiar with Adrienne Marie Brown and her emergent strategy, thanks to the work of uh, collectives statewide and anti-racist curriculum initiatives that um, really involve a lot of educators that know some radical things and know the radical scholars. And so it was really transformative for me to receive that book as a gift. And uh, it's something I might not have been, you know, drawn to purchase myself, but once I got into it, I really appreciated how it, you know, it didn't really try to look like a book. And um, it just really helped me learn so much about different ways pleasure could be a teacher to me and the ways pleasure could help me learn how to create boundaries. Um, and it really triggered a lot of reflectiveness about how hard I work to be in the career position that I am now and how little pleasure I gained from all of the things I worked so hard to accomplish. Um, and this feeling of not being able to, like in my brain, I know that I have so much gratitude for so many things, but for some reason, my body felt like crying and it felt bad things. It wasn't feeling the abundance and gratitude that I know I have. Um, so pleasure activism was for me, a place that helped me, a, a concept that helped me get there. So I want you to reflect on your pleasure perceptions. And so you might pause uh, here and you can turn down the sound if you want to read these yourselves or listen to me read to you the questions. Do you have reactions or feelings hearing the word pleasure? Define pleasure. What life lessons have you had about pleasure? How much do you prioritize mm -hmm. your pleasure? Do or did your loved ones and ancestors have access to pleasure? When I think about this in these questions, um, as a single mom as well, it's like, it's really hard to find pleasure when you're working full time and you're, for those of you that are single parents, um, you know, just trying to find time for pleasure. That was really, really, really hard um, in the beginning to even do because we're constantly pulled this way and that way. Um, and then doing kids as well. It's, it was just hard. And so you really have to sit and think about like, where are the moments where I can actually find pleasure and do pleasure? And what is pleasurable to me? What is considered pleasure? So I just want to offer that up. I know that when um, this concept of pleasure and, and I grew up very religious and, and this, it was always seen as, um, Ooh, pleasure in the workplace. You can't do that. That's, that's not supposed to even exist in the workplace. That's something that happens outside in private time. And, um, this has been so healing. And also that, that book that you mentioned, Stephanie really has revolutionized my ideas as well of, of what pleasure is. And so, um, right. I did have some initial reactions about that's not that doesn't that's not not part of school it's not part of work it's not part of um and I'm so grateful that that again um shifted my script <laughs> I totally did think I was hoping you would share that Patricia especially because um some of you that are watching this might already know Patricia and she's one of our you know really uh free friends that knows so much and I always thought of somebody that's not weighed down by some of that stuff um, and so then to hear her say that, you know, it made me want to do a little CBT session and think that's not your value. You know, you don't, I don't think you believe that those things that you're saying, I don't see that reflected in, in your values and the way you live your life. But that's because maybe it, it had just not been questioned yet. We hadn't gotten to the pleasure moment, uh, but I want to show you the definition of pleasure activism because what is exactly pleasure activism? It is 
it's kind of simple. Pleasure is a feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. If the word pleasure makes you uncomfortable, you could use the word enjoy instead. Um, but, you know, I hope that you'll try to get yourself on a journey to get a little bit comfortable with the concept of enjoying yourself. Uh, activism consists of efforts to promote, impede, or direct social, political, economic, or environmental reform or stasis with the desire to make improvements in society. Pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole happy and satisfiable selves from the impacts, delusions, and limitations of oppression and or supremacy. Adrienne Marie Brown, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, 2019. Uh, so how activism becomes pleasure is because there's so much uh, that it's political about pleasure and who is allowed to enjoy themselves where or when or how to what extent people are um, deemed as worthy of pleasure. And we internalize those messages and a lot of us are already familiar with that concept of feeling guilty about enjoying yourself. Or even for example, like when I, in a work meeting, suggested that we consider what we enjoy about our work and ways that we enjoy uh, communing together instead of just, you know, randomly planning another committee or more meetings that we'd be mindful about, how do we not grumble about what we have to do? Um, and I got shut down really hard and really quickly and not just in a way like, oh, we don't agree with that, but in like a, why would you voice that here? You know, the response was really more about, well, you know, we, we're we here for our jobs, not for our pleasure. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm going to still occasionally keep bringing that up because I am trying to be radical and an activist about what is enjoyable and pleasure. And I do have a right and I have worth to enjoy myself and to not be miserable in my career and to not always just be martyring myself in sacrifice for the institution, for students, for the colleagues, for others at my own expense. Because some people don't have to work and hustle so hard and sacrifice so much. So when you choose not to, that's you dismantling to an extent. And when you elevate, if you're the person that's privileged and benefiting from a lot of this, I'm gonna need you to put in a little bit more work and do some more service and take some of that service off of somebody else's plate who's been carrying way too much of it. Okay. I want you to allow yourself pleasure and rest. And I have some words for you about rest in particular. We are in crisis. This rest movement is not some cute and frivolous idea, but instead an intentional disruption against very violent systems. It has a potential to save lives and restore bodies and minds. It is healing work that will not be easy. It is a resistance wrapped in softness and bold enough to stand up to the powers that be and quietly, loudly proclaim, we will rest. Trisha Hershey, Rest is Resistance Manifesto, 2022. I came to Trisha Hershey's work after the pleasure activism work and I take them hand in hand because to me, uh, one, rest can be enjoyable, <laughs> um, but they were both lenses that helped me learn to change um, how I was going about my work and how I was going about my boundaries and really transform the way I approached work-life balance. I still struggle with these things and something um, as I was saying that I had been on sabbatical for six months and then I came back and I really thought that I was going to rock everything and that like, <laughs> yes, I knew that I was going to be, you know, piloting a new approach to my work and that it might not be perfect, but I didn't. I didn't think that it would fail spectacularly <laughs> hard. <laughs> um, and even though I respected my boundaries and like now a few weeks after the panic attack phase of the process, um, I am just thinking about how, oh, of course, like the work is encroaching, it's growing. And, uh, and I also, like, I have different perspectives. I am more sensitive. My calibration to what is toxic or, or what feels like exploitation, I'm so sensitive to feeling that it's happening in ways that I did not feel before. Um, so I'm going to have to change how I really 
do my boundaries and come back to this, uh, to these messages. And I already learned quite a bit about what I enjoy doing and try to shape what committees I'm on or what work I do through that lens and my values. But even when it's still not enough, what I, what is helping me go back into that work is the reminder that, that it is not just for me, but that this work is for others as well. It's because that when I voice that my body hurts and I can't anymore today, that a lot of people will tell me later that it helped them snap themselves out of overwork, if only for a little moment. And it helped them see themselves as maybe somebody who deserves to occasionally sit down and let their body recover. So let's get ready for a little bit of writing again. We're going to do a connect with pleasure journal session and you can turn down the volume and mute your video or listen to me read the questions. What brought you to this work? What was the vision you had for the job and yourself? What did you imagine would be the pleasures and perks in your job? What are work experiences that bring you pleasure and feel fulfilling? And if you're joining us again after your pause, um, I, I, for me, I want to offer that one of the things that brings me the most pleasure is seeing my, seeing my students succeed. And I really have a mission of seeing people accomplish more than they even imagined or knew existed. And so especially when students come back and they tell me they got their degree or they open their business um, and you know they're they're they've got the job of their dreams and they're happy or they're helping their family in the ways that they saw. Those are such meaningful experiences to me. Um, and I also want to remind you that pleasure and rest don't mean that we're not actually invested in the success of each other and our students, but actually that these are pathways for doing better about that. Um, Alicia, do you have some thoughts about? You know, how did you imagine the job might be pleasurable or enjoyable and what experiences feel good for you? Yeah, so mine's is similar to yours, but I also wanted to, um, you know, display that for the ones that look like me, you can do it. So if we're sitting in these, you know, educational seats where people feel like, oh, I'm not smart enough. Oh, I, you know, I can't really get past these classes just us being there alone, you know, to see someone that looks just like me. She looks just like me. She's experiencing things that I've experienced. I'm a single mom um, and I'm trying to make it. And if I could see her in this seat, I can always, I can do it too. So I, I've always, you know, what brings me fulfillment is, is when students walk in and they smile and be like, man, you know, you're giving me hope um, and I could do it. And then they come back and say, Hey, I graduated. I'm like, hey, what's next? <laughs> what are we doing next? So <laughs> that uh that gives me a lot of pleasure. Yeah, I, I agree with that so much. And and what you just said resonated because today I turned in my application for my EDD program. Yay! And I remember the um sitting in the class and my professor was a single mom and she had her doctorate. And I remember at 20, I was 29 at the time looking at her representation is so important, right? Um, looking at her and saying, I can do it too. I can do it. And so um, accomplishing goals is definitely something that gives me pleasure. That felt real good to turn in that application today. Um, and I would also agree with you, Stephanie, seeing our students thrive and succeed is brings me a lot of fulfillment and fills my cup. Um, seeing students that started never thinking they were going to be successful at school and just walking through a local elementary school and seeing that person as the principal, uh, that gave me a lot of pleasure. Um, and working with you, working with you too, mm. brought me a lot of pleasure. I'm grateful for this part of my career. Thank you. Much love. <laughs> <laughs> um, reasons to try pleasure and rest. Uh, if you're not convinced yet, that was a lovely segue to talk about the what it brings to our students. Uh, pleasure and rest can help you discover and learn about you and your needs. Um, it sometimes until you take the rest 
you won't notice how much pain your body is feeling. Um, I, as someone with chronic uh, neck and back pain, I am constantly finding myself um, in like too deep in the pain. And that means like, I, I was ignoring, you know, and it's like, but I didn't feel it. And sometimes we're holding in that pain, um, or that physical discomfort or so focused on what we're doing and trying to get through everything that we don't notice the posture and position we're in and what's happening with our body. And I didn't come to that from this career. I, learned that as someone who worked starting from early childhood. I learned that as someone who was around people who worked a lot and ignored their physical needs. You know, as teachers, for example, a really easy one to spot is that we we don't go to the bathroom when we need to. We may not have an opportunity to drink water or go to the bathroom or eat. Uh, this is especially true, I think, for people in the like K-12 realm. When I was in K-12, it was like, it felt like back to back to back especially if you're on yard du duty or some of these other things. And with back-to-back -back meetings that we often have, and we're often showing up out of breath to a commitment. And even if we're physically fit, we might be showing up out of breath. And that's because not the stairs or the hill on the campus, but because we're unrested, friends. Resting helps create capacity for new ideas and imaginings so that we can come up with something different for these from these systems because even the things that we're coming up with now are a little too compatible with the way things have done to make any kind of significant change and the scholarship says that for you to help your community and loved ones exist for more than labor something that's been really powerful to me and motivated me to keep talking about and practicing pleasure and rest is that it changed my mom's life is that my mom credits me for teaching her how to take a bath and my sister helping her like put the bath oils in there and rest and helping her understand that it might be okay to take one day off and to on Sunday read a book and rest because she started thinking about making room for her to be physically and mentally and emotionally well and that we told her it was important and so when I hear, you know, my mom friends talk about that, I know that you're making a lot of the sacrifices that prevent that space, but the people who love you don't want to see you exhausted. The people that love you want to see you thriving and feeling good. And it helps us be happy when you are happy and when you are well. And it helps all of us cope with our difficulties when we have a foundation of wellness. And I want you to do it for your well-being and life because too often there are really serious physical consequences to ignoring the pains and to keep pushing through and keep hustling and sacrificing ourselves. And we know a lot of our friends in the work are sick, either a little bit sick or constantly with the small illnesses. But as life progresses, we also see people with a lot of severe and terminal illness. And we may even individually be mourning the loss of people in our lives that may not have really had a chance at pleasure and rest. So I want you to create an opportunity for us and you're gonna choose one of these activities. Make it to don't list, write a list of things that are upsetting or put you in a displeasure cycle. Look at and update your list regularly. Or alternatively, you might just take your to-do list and cross some things out and mark them as to don't. Prioritize pleasure. Start a list of meetings, committees, and work tasks that you do. Mark the ones that bring you pleasure and mark the ones that bring you displeasure. See how many of the displeasurable ones you might be able to quit. Make a playlist, find or create a playlist or several that help bring you calm, focus, or energy. I know for me, my usual calm playlists were not working anymore. And I thought, you know, what do you listen to in what is a difficult time and a time of genocide? And that really brought me to a whole different genre of music that I hadn't put some time into for a long time and, and that helped me really access some coping in a more effective way. 
Mm. Um, we also have a great playlist um, available in our resources. So if people are looking for some ideas. Thanks. And Patricia is actually going to share some more about how uh, these playlists and how some movement practices can help us. All right. So um, I'm excited to come to you and talk about the topic of healing. Um, I think that a lot of what we've talked about so far um, might have elevated some ways we need healing, right? When we're thinking about just um displeasure or feelings that we do not like to have at work, right? Might have brought up some of the things that, oh, we actually, I got some stuff to heal from. Um, and so that's what this next session is about. Next section is about. Um, so healing, healing is um, the definition you know, specific definition, um, the process of becoming whole, um, of being well, of being sound, right? And so how do we move towards that together? Um, I'm going to read a quote. Um, and the day came when the wrist to remain tight in the, bu in the um, bulb became more painful than the risk it took to blossom. A nice nin. Um, I remember when I first saw this quote and it was so um, powerful to see um, my life experience <laughs> said in such a beautiful way, right? There comes a point in our healing where we cannot um, stay tight um, and turn away from it. And there is nothing more for us to do than to take the risk um, to move forward towards healing. So healing is very interesting. Um, there, it, it, it happens in a cycle um, and I'm gonna share with you the steps of this cycle today and hopefully it will become part of your practices that um, when you feel like there are things that you want to heal or move through that you apply these practices. And I think we've also already started to do that together. Awareness, right? Awareness of self. Um, and we have done lots of activities today to give you opportunities to, to really think about how do I feel about this? Where did I get this idea? Who taught me about this to begin with? And do I still agree with those ideas? And, and where am I going to? Um, so awareness of self, um, the honoring, um, then we have to give gratitude for um, what that healing and emotion that it brought up, what that incident and the emotion that it caused in us um, brought up is to thank it. Thank it for the ways that it protected us, because that's actually what our body is doing when um, we are put in a situation of trauma. Um, healing happens when we notice a trauma, give gratitude for it and find ways to release it. So the last step is the release. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do today, right? We've had opportunities to think about how we're feeling. Um, I think pleasure to me really is a, a part of gratitude, right? So much um, love and pleasure um, show up when we're caring for self. So we thank it for what it's done to protect us and then we're ready to let it go. And so that's what we're gonna be doing today with some nervous system resets. Um, choosing some, so I want you to think about something from earlier in this session. Some, um, you at the beginning wrote down some feelings that you do not want to have at work. And uh, maybe that some specific incident came up to you. Um, or as we were talking about love languages and appreciation in the workplace, um, maybe a specific incident came up to you and we've had work woven into all of, um, the session so far. So think about something that you, um, want to hold in your mind. Um, and then we're going to honor it. Give thanks for the ways that your body showed up to protect you in this incident, all right? All the, the ways that your emotions, whatever your reaction was, and we, and we know that our reaction oftentimes to trauma is fight, flight, fawn, or people please is that last one. Um, and so, thanking it for how it showed up to protect you. Give thanks in a way that resonates with you. Um, thank the situation and emotion for what it has taught you. And then release. Um, so these nervous system resets that we're gonna do um, are gonna allow you to release that emotion. And um, it may not happen immediately. Um, oftentimes that release comes gradually, right? So um, this, um, I want you to think about um, 
the level of distress that this emotion that you're thinking about gives you. Um, and then you also want to check in with yourself after do, doing some of these um, strategies and s- notice if there has been an impact in it, right? And then repeat. This is a cycle to repeat over and over again. So a couple nervous, there's lots of different ways that we can reset our nervous system. And actually when we are um, harmed in some way, um, our body reacts. Um, It has a natural reaction to protect us. Um, And so, um, and how that shows up in some of our bodies is, uh, is anxiety, is physical pain, is disease, disease. Um, and so when you're noticing that in your body, I love that most of our nervous system resets are with us all the time, right? They are part of our toolkit. We just have to turn and engage them. So breath work, breath work of any kind is going to support you in resetting your nervous system and releasing um, these emotions that are stuck in our body. So um, breath work helps. Alicia was saying at the beginning of our um, recording today, we were engaging in some breathing activities to calm our bodies. Um, There's five finger breathing, there's um, box breathing, there's breath work sessions you can have with a practitioner, but our breath is always with us. Um, another one that I really love, uh, cause I have been a dancer my whole life and now learning about how important shaking your body out is, um, I can see the connection as to maybe why I loved it so much. Shaking our bodies, shaking it out. If we, um, wherever you're sitting, why don't you just tap your heels on the ground, shake your shoulders, shake your hands, shake your head, right? Just giving your body a big shake shake it out. And that is something we always have with us too, right? I love those big movements that Stephanie has. We can jump up and down. Yes, all the ways that we can shake it out. And I think that is really why um, dance is so important as part of this. So that playlist that we've got accessed um, in our resources, turn it on loud and move your body. The one that we're going to spend the most time on today is um, something called the tapping solution, um, also e- ETF or EFT, the emotional freedom technique. Um, and you can see um, in the image that we have on the left is a woman who has um, points on her body that have dots. And these are actually meridian places that when we tap them, they um the result is a calming of our nervous system. And so I'm going to read the sequence of movements, and then I'm going to um, explain the tapping solution, um, the five steps of it, and then we'll practice together. So the first um, meridian point is at the top of your head, and you're just going to hold your three fingers together on either your right hand or your left hand and tap a few times on the top of your head. The next position that we tap is on the inside of your eyebrow. So tap your eyebrow after the top of your head, and then we tap to the outside of that same eye. So tap the outside of your eye and then tap lightly underneath your eye underneath your eye. And then we're going to go to under the nose and tapping. We move to under the chin and tapping. We move to the collarbone and tap either right side or left side. And then you might go under your arm, left side or right side, under your armpit, about your um, rib cage space. And then the last one we're going to do is on the side of our hand right here, the side of our hand. That's where we stop. And then we would repeat that that sequence over and over again. That is really if you have the time to do it. But if you are needing immediate release, you can tap on these meridian points. Um, And let's go through the steps that make it more than just tapping on your body. Um, So the first part of um, EFT is identify the issue and the emotion. So going back to that situation that we asked you to think about. Um, The second step is rate the intensity of the emotion you're focusing on right now. So thinking about that incident and the level of emotional distress that you have around it. Um, 
And then you're going to create a statement, a setup statement. Um, I've had heard from lots of people that once they start engaging in this um, practice, that they use it a variety of times um, in the car, during traffic, in a meeting um, with challenging colleagues, right, in um, in stressful situations. So this is a tool you can use at any time. So your step three, create the setup statement. And it starts with even though, and followed by the issue you're focused on and a phrase of acceptance. So mine is, even though I have um, been feeling devalued for my efforts, I have my applause coming in in many places and I am valued, right? So um, we will, I will say that as I'm going through these steps. Think about what your statement's going to be starting with, even though Stephanie has hers. Yeah, I want to offer, even though I feel overwhelmed and disrespected. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. And so the issue you're focusing on, and then what's your phrase of acceptance? Soy chingona. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. How about Alicia? Do you have an even though statement you've created? Even though my body is not where I want it to be right now, I accept the fact that it's changing every day in a positive way. Thank you. Okay, so there's an example of what your statement can be for that step three. And then we're going to go through the sequences and say that to yourself quietly. You might want to pause even, or not pause, but um, silence the sound so that you're not hearing um, anything other than your own statements. But I am going to start at the top of my head. And even though I have been feeling um, devalued, I am um, have lots of places in my world. Go to the side of your eye, um, underneath your eye, right? I have lots of places in my world that I can find value. Um, even though the situation is making me feel disrespected and stressed, I, underneath your chin, tapping on your collarbone, underneath your armpit, and your chub. So we're, I'm gonna show you that again, this next slide, if you are wanting to see the process, let's do it again one more time. Top of the head, eyebrow, side of your eye, under eye, under nose, under chin. Collarbone, underarm, and side of hand. Is it just me or when we tap on the eyebrow, it's something about the eyebrow that releases a certain kind of pressure. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Do you I don't feel that too, or am I tripping? <laughs> I don't think it's just you, but I don't feel that. I was okay. also wondering, I for me, my collarbone. Oh, okay. like so, like I don't want to stop tapping. Something's yeah. going on there. <laughs> the other <laughs> chakra is busted. I love that, right? That that these are intentional meridian points in our bodies that do release um, energy, right? That do, when we tap on them, cleanse the way for our, our clean, help clear our chakras, right? And and create space for the energy to flow. And so I'm, I love that you both elevated that it's different for you, right? And so now I think you both know your place, right? Uh, you're, you're in a meeting and you just need to, you know, <laughs> uh, covertly, regulate your nervous system. <laughs> um, so the last step in the process is to then ask yourself, you know, again, um, rate the intensity of the emotion. Um, and are you noticing that there's been any shift? And if not, to engage in that process again, to not give up, 
um, to play around with the statement. Um, and each time you go through, you might change the statement to add more and more um, acceptance of where you're at and where you're going. Did you notice any difference? I, I heard you both kind of say you noticed with a specific meridian, um, but in your overall intensity, did you notice? Yeah, it was like a pressure release, like a calming, a pressure release for, for sure for me. Great. I did not uh, because the way I kind of hold my body and my personality when I'm doing presenting or teaching or something, like I'm a little bit in kind of, you know, this mode that it takes me out of like a full sensitive embodiment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, you know, it, I don't always feel it so intensely at that spot. So that's something I want to kind of try spending time on later. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I encourage all of you that are joining us to um, engage in some of these nervous system um, resets as you, um, Use the process of healing, awareness, honoring, and releasing um, of emotions. And now we're going to wrap up this wonderful time together with a guided meditation. And I love that um, Stephanie will kind of weave in so much of what we've been doing together as she elevates and sends us on our way. Thanks for that setup. I'm also a yoga instructor, um, in addition to an English instructor. And so I want to just offer some words informed by that practice, uh, but really also by the principles of pleasure activism and rest as resistance. So I'd like you to try to create a quiet space. When we were at the Encore workshop, a lot of people sat on the floor or lay down, drape their jackets over themselves like a blanket. Uh, feel free to, especially if you're in, in, in an individual space, you might, you know, take your shoes off. Like think of like, how would it feel good for you to be in what position would kind of feel good and restful and kind of in a position where you're, you're, you know, down to listen to somebody's words. I have a healing candle lit and I have some words prepared for you, but I'm also trying to be in the moment and let it flow. I want to start by offering something from Trisha Hershey as you lay down and start to breathe more slowly and deeply and with more amount of your body, allowing the vessel for air that is your body expand more so that you can get some more of that good oxygen in. Trisha Hershey in one of her rest deck cards says, divest from capitalism, lay down somewhere. When you feel guilt and shame for resting, view it as evidence of your brainwashing via grind culture. Be grateful for this insight and use it to transform the guilt into power. Rest guilt-free knowing you are following a path to liberation. Rest is your right and an ancient practice. Rest, deprogram, repeat. As you keep breathing, you might carry your breath through your body, thinking of the top of your head, all the way down to your toes, focusing on how much your belly expands. Try your best to let that belly fill with air as much as possible and to just let your body be anywhere you're holding tension. Like for me, my shoulders, you might squeeze and then release them and release your jaw and release the clench anywhere else you have it. I wish for you and for your loved ones to have clean water and nutritious food. I wish for you and your loved ones to be surrounded by people who love and see and value you. I wish for you to feel softness and comfort and safety. I wish for you and your loved ones at home and with each other and out in these streets and in the workplace, feel respected and valued, cared about and cared for safe. 
supported. I want you to have rest. I want you to feel capable of using your agency. I want you to see the people surrounding you succeeding. I want you to see yourself as a catalyst for change. I want you to have so much room in your life for love and healing and pleasure. Naho. Thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. Thank you for that. Next slide. And you can find our contact information and love, healing, and pleasure references and resources at the tiny URL or using the QR code below. We have a link tree with some of those, uh, like the playlist that we talked about earlier. There's so much more that we look forward to sharing with you. We would love to have this Q&A. We know some of you out there have questions. Um, and we look forward to being in community and in conversation with you about these concepts. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.